From my perspective, Trump took America first into America alone. The threats are real. He's the sitting governor of a red state that went for Trump in 2016. How long can you stay in this race and can you make it onto that debate stage? The only one of the field of 37 that actually won a Trump state. We're here to make sure that Donald Trump is a one-term president. Hello and welcome to G Zero World. I'm Ian Bremmer and today I've got a big show for you. I'm talking presidential politics, the battle for the soul of the Democratic Party and words like moderate and bipartisanship that nobody seems to use anymore. And who better to help me sort that out than a gun owner boot wearer from Trump country who wants to drain the swamp, but also favors abortion rights and once officiated a same-sex wedding. I'm not kidding. I'm actually talking about Montana Governor Steve Bullock, the very rare, heck, even endangered political animal who convinced voters in a deep red state, which Trump won by 20 points, to turn blue. If you're a Democrat concerned about the U.S. general elections, this is a presidential candidate you might want to listen to. But instead, Bullock doesn't even get a seat at the debates. The reasons why offer a hint at what's undermining our entire political system. Now, don't worry, I've also got your puppet regime. Red is the color of regime change. First, a word from the folks who help us keep the lights on. You've heard this before. People in red states and blue states are just different. Gridlock in Washington reflects that, and it's getting worse, with roots that are downright tribal. If you grew up conservative, that's your team. Your politics are reinforced by the friends you keep, the media you consume. Same thing with liberals. Switching parties would be like my Red Sox nation rooting for the Yankees. No matter how bad the pitching is in Boston, and it's truly got awful, it's just not gonna happen. But what if I told you not to believe the hype. Politics is polarizing, yes, the sky is blue, but there's also a lot Americans agree on. Have a look at the numbers. Nine in 10 Americans favor background checks for gun sales, including three quarters of all NRA members. Bet you didn't know that. More than eight in 10 say undocumented immigrants who arrived as children should not be deported. Seven in 10 support an alternative energy policy. Why not? Six in 10 support same-sex marriage. That's up roughly 40% from a decade ago, and the list goes on. In fact, these days, just under half of Americans say they don't actually identify with a political party at all, including yours truly. So why such extremes in rhetoric on the campaign trail? Well, for starters, politicians don't have to speak to everyone because everyone doesn't vote. 43% of Americans decided not to cast a ballot in the last presidential election. That's 100 million people. I'm just gonna say it again. 100 million eligible voters didn't bother. And yet the candidate weaning process known as the primaries is even worse. Last time around, less than one in three showed up at the ballot box. That's like only those from New York and California deciding a presidential nominee was worth their hassle. Less than 58 million people making decisions for another quarter of a billion. Think about that. Then consider this, primary voters are where the greatest polarization actually happens in 1994 only about one in 10 described themselves as consistently liberal or consistently conservative. Today, that number has jumped threefold. So it's not only that the candidates at the polls are more ideological, but they're also the ones with the big influence. The reasons are varied, left versus right-wing media, big donors, redistricting, but we're still talking about a comparatively small number of people, a fraction of the US population. So no, Americans are not coming apart by the seams, but by not showing up on election day, they risk handing over the keys to a cast of characters who don't reflect their values at all, whether they're Democrat or Republican. I think Montana's a small population state. Mm -hmm greater population than Vermont or Delaware. It's just two examples. Interesting examples. Are those random examples? Just random examples. I mean, there are people that run from those states. <laughs> I've heard. Governor Montana, Steve Bullock. Ian, it's great to be with you. Good to be with you, sir. You are running for president. 
I am. Which is an objectively ludicrous thing to do. <laughs> I mean, did, did yeah. you, at what point did it become obvious to you that, my God, I'm actually making this decision, me personally, I'm, I'm going to say that yeah. I can be president of America? Yeah, and certainly wasn't, even as I was serving initially as governor, it wasn't the thought, I'll be governor of a state, I'll run for president. It was sometime after the 2016 election. And it was two different things that really pushed me along the way to that. One of which was, so I was the only Democrat in the country to get reelected, right, in a statewide uh, race where Trump won. He took Montana. Won by 20. Yeah, he won by 20. I won by four. 25 to 30 percent of my voters voted for Donald Trump. And it's interesting because I was asked to travel quite a bit after that. Mm -hmm. And when I'd go to Democrat groups or progressive groups, and I'd say 25 to 30% of my voters voted for Donald Trump. Invariably, the response was, what's wrong with those voters? Or a little skeptically, like, what's wrong with you, Bullock? Yeah, and there could be some overlap. <laughs> yeah, you never know. Yeah, yeah. Never like, how is it that if people are voting their economic, their healthcare, their education interests, they ought to be voting for Democrats? How is it that in a state like Iowa, a third of their counties went Obama, Obama, Trump? Trump. And places where we should be winning, we're losing. So that was part of it, just the concern of the further polarization and Democrats not getting that if we are a party, party of just the coasts, we're never going to be able to win and we'll never be able to govern. And then the other piece that really, I guess, hit me is that, look, I think everybody walks in the start of a new administration with some hopes that government can function in a constructive and positive way for people's lives. I mean, maybe if we'd started with infrastructure instead of repealing the Affordable Care Act or, but it was not only, I guess, what he's been doing as a president, but the way he's been governing. I mean, the behavior that he's now normalizing. I do think it's a challenging time in this 243 year experiment called representative democracy, which should require anybody to stand up and say, We've got to get back to some norms, and we could do a lot better if what we're going to do is pass on to the next generation something better than what we now, have. Now, you among the candidates know a lot of Trump voters a lot better, right? So given that, I mean, what, who are these people in Montana? What are they like? What excited them about Trump? Why are they still supporting yeah. him? Yeah, and I think in part, like, there are folks all across this country that want to say, like a Trump voter is sort of monolithic, right? It's a, they're all exactly this. Um, and I think that that's a mistake for us because I think that my view is Trump was the result, not the cause. Meaning when, boy, 60% of Americans haven't had a pay increase in real terms in 40 years. When you look at it for, when I was growing up in the early 70s, 90% of 30 year olds doing better than the parents were at age 30. Today, it's only half. So a whole lot of folks just felt like the economy's not working for me. Washington, D.C. is captured by dark money or it's captured by, it doesn't represent my needs, so why not blow up the system? And in some respects, I think that was a lot of the Trump voters is saying that he said he'll drain the swamp even though it's swampier today than it ever was. Well, the cabinet certainly yeah. is extraordinarily special interest, but that was one of his big messages, yeah. right? It's yeah, in the swamp. yeah, I would get D.C. working for you. And he also said he'd have workers' backs along the way, even though most of the policy prescriptions that he has sure hasn't been helping those workers or those farmers or those factory workers. So I think in part the Trump voters initially were saying that the economy and the political system isn't working for me. So why not take a risk on somebody like this? And as we go on, you know, we've seen, yeah, his favorabilities haven't been that high. I continue to think there's about 35% of this country that certainly be with him no matter what. But what we've got to do is focus on those folks that ought to be voting with us and bring them back. Because this is, you know, in some ways this is math, right? <laughs> It's, Somebody, it's another candidate that already has that, right? Yeah, so you don't yeah. Want to not, go ma not math in uh, the Yang terms, but math in that we've got to be able to win back places that we lost, the Michigans, Wisconsin, the Pennsylvania, if we're going to win this election. Um, big issue dividing the country right now. 
gun control. Yeah. You're in a red state. You're governor. There's a lot of hunting, a lot of NRA card carrying sure. Republican members. You want to get rid of assault weapons. Yeah. Um, how can you sell that to those people? Well, I think let's begin with some of the basics. Like I'll never forget uh, after the Vegas shooting. Sitting hundreds my, and hundreds of people injured yeah, by yeah. one crazy guy. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And I'm sitting in my office and say, when we were asked to lower the flags, I'm like, I don't even know what to write in this proclamation. And a young coworker, staffer says, oh, we now have templates for mass shootings. I've lowered the flags nine times since Vegas, seven times since Parkland. Um, a fourth of the times under President Obama and President Trump since I've been uh, governor. So I think we're finally hitting this point that we know that we have to do more. You point out like the NRA, and I'm a gun owner, right? I hunt, I'm like 40%. Isn't it mandatory in Montana <laughs> to own a gun? I We'd mean. let you in, yeah. even, even if you didn't. But, but it's actually 40% of the households in this country have a firearm in it. So it's, so it's not just a Western thing. But I'm also a parent and a governor. If we could ever look at this as a public health issue, not as a political issue, we would know what to do. Universal background checks, the vast majority of NRA members, the vast majority of Republicans agree to that. Do you talk to NRA in Montana? I mean, as an organization, you talk to them in Washington. Have you, have, have you had any, because all the things that you're saying sound abundantly sensible, but they are not moving through but, Congress. But, but, but that's exactly my point. Think yeah. about it. When I was growing up in Montana, the NRA, it was a gun safety, hunting and shooting organization. Mm -hmm. I'll give you 30 million reasons why zero progress has been made on even background checks. That's the $30 million the NRA has invested in Trump's election. Think about right after Parkland. He said immediately, we should probably have universal background checks. Remember that, that's right. Yes, Governor. President, again, thank you for having us. I approach this certainly as a governor. Um, I approach it as a gun owner. That 11-year-old son got his first deer right. uh, this past fall. He's a good boy. I approach it as a victim. I had a nephew shot and killed an 11-year-old on a playground. Here is a moment where everybody's talking, where we can hopefully start saying, what could actually meaningfully impact this, not just for today, but for the future? He made one phone call to Wayne LaPierre Backward. and he walked backwards. Yeah. Same thing after El Paso and Dayton. So I think that the only way that we make progress in some ways is either finally disassembling the NRA and figuring out where that money's actually coming from. Because, you know, sort of if you look at gun safety issues, I think it is tied to sort of the dark money world, this post-Citizens United world. But I also think that at some point, even gun owners have to stand up and say, we agree on a lot more than we disagree. And nobody's trying to take everyone's guns away. And some of these, what I would say are public health measures that we can all agree on, like universal background checks, ought to be a no-brainer at this point. Now, what, you talked just now about dark money. And on your sort of first day to-do list, you say executive order making disclosure requirements yeah. or these corporations are not going to get government contracts. Why cannot that not be a piece of legislation that can't be overturned by the next president? Why does that have to be just an executive order? Well, on the one hand, it shouldn't be, right? So I was attorney general before I was governor and had actually brought the states together against Citizens United, wrote the brief that the majority of states, even a bunch of Republican states signed on to. Then after that didn't work out, uh, brought the first case to the US Supreme Court, trying to take apart Citizens United. Last summer, Montana led more than half the states in asking the court to address the narrow federal issues presented by Citizens United. Instead, the court reached a broad decision that questions more than a century of law in Montana and across the country. Yet the case and reactions on both sides of the political aisle have largely overlooked the decision's impact on the vast majority of elections in this country, those that are held at the state and the local levels. My legislature is almost two-thirds Republican. Like, got passed a bill that said 90 days out from an election, I don't care if you call yourself Americans for America for America, whatever it might be, you have to disclose every dollar you're spending. And we got that done in a bipartisan basis. So I'd love to see movement in Washington, D.C. I mean, look, before Citizens United, 2% of the outside spending was from groups that don't disclose their donors. Today, it's over half. 
This isn't to me a fringe issue. When we talk about climate, when we talk about gun safety, when we talk about income inequality, when we talk about Costco can negotiate prescription drug prices, but it's illegal for the federal government to do it, I think so much of it does go back to kind of the corrupting influence of money in our system. So the executive order, and I did the same thing in Montana, said, I can't tell you, you can't spend or contribute in my elections. Mm -hmm. But if you want a contract from the state, you just have to disclose that spending. I'm wondering, now that you've been on the trail for a few months, have you gotten any pushback, either directly or indirectly, specifically on that issue? No, you know, I got pushback even when I was moving that legislation in Montana, in Montana. because it can impact folks on both the left and the right. So not direct pushback in that respect. I do, you know, I have 10 years in public office. I've never had somebody come up to me and say, I just don't think there's enough spending in our elections, <laughs> right? Yeah. When folks recognize that DC is not working for them, that we pay more for prescription drugs in any country in the world and we have nothing to show for it, or that the Republican Party is the only major political party in the world now that won't acknowledge climate change is real, or a generation of workers being replaced by independent contractors when union membership is half what it is in the 80s. People may not look at sort of money in politics as the primary issue, but they see it's impacting everything and, else. And I get that completely. I'm yeah. asking more about the lobbyists, the special interests, the people that matter for the election and re-election of so many people in office today in the United States, only getting bigger. I'm just wondering, have you heard anything not, from them? Yeah, and not possibly because for my 10 years in public office, it's been kind of the fight of my career. And I think it is the challenge mm -hmm. of our time. So perhaps those are the ones that will never talk to me anyway. And if so, that's okay, right? Yeah, you know, I'm mean, okay, he's way out yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. I don't really worry about Yeah, and, and we've got to figure out a way that even more that everybody feels like they have a stake in these elections. And I think a lot of people in this country just feel like they don't because they don't recognize that their voice you know, the corporation can't vote on election day, but they can. And we haven't talked about trade yet. Um, and obviously, um, big fight right now, most importantly between the U.S. and China, uh, tariffs being raised. You've got a lot of farmers in Montana that have been yeah. hurt directly on this issue. Um, you take a pretty tough line on China, but you are not in favor of Trump's policies. Tell me, Tell me what you think needs to happen. Yeah, yeah, and, and even, you know, so I was in Rippey, Iowa, a town of, I think, 400 people. Two stories, and this was just at the grain elevator. So this wasn't a bunch of, like, identified Democrats. Yeah. Like one guy saying, when Trump tweets, we literally lose hundreds of thousands of dollars. And another one, sixth generation farmer, saying, I don't know if I want my son to go into this. And there's not a chance that these payments from the Department of Agriculture is gonna make up for market share. So the they- Subsidies that Trump yeah. has been promising in return. No, that's right. It's being lost. Yeah, so they get it. And I think that from my perspective, Trump took America first into America alone in foreign trade and in largely in foreign affairs. Look, we should be tough on China. What they did 25 years ago was steel, to credit cards, to microchips. Now they're doing it to tech. But the way to get there from my perspective, isn't just to say, you, let's use the blunt instrument of tariffs, mm -hmm. because that's not even hitting the tech side where we're having all the theft problems. I mean, the way to bring is to actually bring the global community with us, because the other thing that we've seen is we're ratcheting up this tariff war, that they're actually lowering their tariffs to other countries. So if the answer is not tariffs, if the answer is Steve is president, yep. uh, we're taking those tariffs off, Chinese yippee, yeah. uh, why are they changing the behavior? Well, I, I think sanctioning, making limits on tech transfer and just saying we can't do that necessarily, trying to turn around because other countries are impacted, our traditional allies by the tech transfer as well, pushing for opening up of their markets. I mean, you would know much better than I. I mean, in the 90s, you had, what, a $500 billion economy that's now an $11 trillion economy because the pattern was always the same. Create a sanctuary market, invest state dollars into that industry actor, unleash that industry actor 
on the world. We've seen this time and time again. Yeah, you can seek WTO sanctions and the like, but saying the firm, especially from the tech transfer side, that this just doesn't work anymore. Now, one other place I wanted to ask you about was on Cuba, because you've come out publicly and say that you would like to end the boycott yeah. on Cuba. Um, not something I would have necessarily expected from the governor of Montana. What was behind that? Well, I think it was just that we were getting to a point of normalizing relationships under President Obama. Right, yeah. And I'm not quite certain why, you know, it seems like the other Trump reflex is anything that his predecessor did, he just immediately wants to reverse. And for the liberalization opportunities in Cuba, it did make sense to me to continue along that path. Now, um, we've covered a lot of policy. We're going to cover some non-policy. So first, first thing I have to ask you is, if you're president, what's your Secret Service nickname? What should my Secret Service be? That's what I was asking you, yeah. That's what, what I'm be? asking yeah. you as someone who, yeah. I mean, you're a thoughtful, bright man. You could come up with that. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's the kind of thing that, that W would have done, right? <laughs> He'd call you Stretch, because you're, you know, sort of tall, long glass of cool water in the back there. <laughs> stretch, answer the question. Okay, you are wearing cowboy boots. Are those for me, or do you always wear those on the trail? No, I often wear those. You do? Uh, both on the trail and at home. You do? These are actually alligator boots. They, I noticed that. Um, were any live alligators hurt in the creation yes. of the? Yes. And you're yes. proud of that, right? I'm kind of proud well, I don't, of that. I think that's, that's, why you, that's why you're governor of Red State. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's okay. Have you enjoyed yourself in this process? There are many times you enjoy yourself. First of all, you enjoy yourself when you're actually talking to people that want to believe that government can work and are engaged along the way. And you know that, and these aren't the folks, these aren't the Ian's of the world, these aren't the sort of all of the intelligentsia, it's just regular folks just saying, we can do better than this. That I've enjoyed. I've enjoyed, uh, you know, my daughter's been too busy, but my 12 year old son has been on some of these trails getting, him getting to see different things to. Does he understand what dad is doing? I think they all do, yeah. yeah. When they've all kind of lived in this public eye, you know, their whole time. Now, the question I guess I have to ask. You do? I, I, I you guess have I have to. to. I think I have to. Okay, poll numbers are not knocking the cover off the ball. I think we can say that. Not yet, yep. yeah. Um, and stranger things have happened. Um, but uh, it, w do you close the door? I mean, Hickenlooper was closing the door yeah. on Senate. Yeah. And now he's running. Yeah. And closing the door was a mistake. Yeah. Um, are you closing the door on Senate? You know, I closed the door long before I got into even this race for presidency. And for a couple of different reasons. Like, look, I would like to turn around and we all look at, we should be also talking about places like Indiana, Missouri, North Dakota. Yeah, but you can't run in those places. But we can no longer win in those places. Also true, yeah. And if we actually want to win places like that, we ought to have someone at the top of the ticket that can actually help in red and purple places. And let's assume that we get that person, but it isn't Steve. Oh, let's see, who else actually won in a red or purple state? No, I get it, I'm just yeah. saying. Yeah. I mean, but, and, you, but and, you're closing, and, you are and, closing and, the door, and you're closing the door. Closing the door and I'll do everything possible to make sure that we have a nominee that can actually win. Governor Steve Bullock. Thanks for having Great me. Great to be with you. Great to be with you as well. As the dust settles on former National Security Advisor John Bolton's departure from the White House, we thought we'd take a look back at some of his greatest hits on Puppet Regime. I'm John Bolton, and you listen to me, you punk. Nicholas, it's John. Ah, la gran morsa imperialista. ¿En qué te puedo ayudar? Can we bomb Iran, sir, please? Damn it, John, is there anything in this building that is not under investigation? Well, we still have your television. Oh, good. That's the most trusted advisor in my administration anyway. All right, well, what's taking up so much of the Wi-Fi? Your KD ratio is trash, Ayatollah. It's trash. Check out what I look like with a puppy face on Snapchat. I think the cat ones suit you better. That must be the hamburgers. What the? Oh, oh, oh no. <laughs> it's Bolton. Bolton? Oh, no. <laughs> no. 
Stay quiet, Chris. Stay quiet. Shh, 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 shh. What the hell are you doing in there? And finally, we've got a few suggestions for Bolton's next chapter. I'm very sorry for your loss. As long as it's America's gain, it should be fine. Red is the color of regime change. Flight 395, you want to land, I want to know when the I can destroy Iran. Public regime! That's our show this week. We'll be back next week, just like we are every week. Don't miss it. But in the meantime, if you like what you've seen, and I know that you have because you're still watching, check us out on g0media.com.